Hello and welcome once again to Shepherd of the Valley's weekly video services. I am Pastor Dave Deckard. How are you doing today? I hope that July is finding you well. It's going to get warm, but that's okay. We'll still be together and have a wonderful time doing this weekly worship. And let's begin our time together by praying the prayer of the day. God of the covenant, in our baptism, you call us to proclaim the coming of your kingdom. Give us the courage you gave the apostles that we may faithfully witness to your love and peace in every circumstance of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord comes among us today through the words of the Gospel of Mark, the sixth chapter. Jesus came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and to not put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of our Lord. Now this is a really interesting passage from the Gospel of Mark where Jesus returns to his hometown to people he knows. Now, by this time, he's already done some preaching, some healing, his fame is starting to spread. And you would think the people around him would rejoice that his homecoming would be an occasion for celebration because here he is, the local boy, all of a sudden revealed as someone who was much more than the people thought he was. And these people knew him and loved him, had experience with him. It had all the ingredients for a wonderful celebration of everything Jesus was and everything that God was doing through him. But oddly enough, that is not what happened. Instead, the people of his home region kind of rejected Jesus. They didn't believe in what he was doing. They were not able to see the ministry and the grace that had been given to him. And why? Well, there's a simple reason for that that applies to you and me, and I'm going to frame it like this. They saw what Jesus was instead of who Jesus was. Or, put more accurately, they saw what they thought Jesus was instead of who Jesus really was. Now, human beings like things in order, and they like things understandable. And in order to keep our lives ordered, understandable, controllable, keep ourselves in charge of them, we do a little trick called compartmentalization. In other words, when we get a piece of data from the universe, whether it's the sun rising or meeting someone or going to work or whatever, we like to put it in a box. This is the work box. This is the morning routine box. This is the relationship box. This person is my brother, or this person is my teacher, or this person is a clerk at the store. Hear what we're doing? We're taking the outside stimulus of the whole world and the universe and all the people that we know in it and putting them in a controllable, manageable, definable 
area that we can deal with. And when we do this, we feel like we can relate properly to these things. Well, I know what the sun coming up means. I know how to treat my brother. I know that I should give a $20 bill to that clerk at the store so I can get my groceries. It works in a sense. It helps us navigate and negotiate a world, a universe that is far too big for us to comprehend. And it also keeps us safe from that same universe and that lack of comprehension. If you've ever been out and looked at the stars and had that moment under a clear sky where you go, whoa, this is way too big for me to understand. I am dwarfed by this. And it's a moment of celebration and joy where you're in awe and wonder, but it's also a little scary. You understand why we do this. I can't deal with a universe that's that, that's that big. So what I do is I break it down into small parts that I deal with every day. Now here's the problem with this, is that the universe doesn't really fit into that box, nor do other people fit into that box, nor of course will God fit into that box. So when Jesus returned to his hometown, what did he find? When he had been outside of his hometown and people didn't know him, he found people who were willing to take him as he was, who were willing to admit that there was probably more to him than they understood, especially with the healings and miracles and all that. It kind of busted open that box and people went, whoa, and they were able to accept that maybe the universe was more than they thought. But the people of Jesus's hometown had a disadvantage. They already knew what he was. Isn't this a carpenter? Isn't this Mary and Joseph's kid? Look, we have his siblings. There's six or seven or eight of them right here. They ain't that special. They already knew what Jesus was to them. They had already put him in that box. And so when he came and started talking about things outside of that box, they were like, whoa, 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 buddy. Hold on a second. This doesn't fit in our perception of you. This is not what you really are. We already know what you really are. We have decided it, and your head will peak no farther than the top of this lid. Well, Jesus, even as an ordinary human being, wouldn't fit into that, let alone as the Son of God and our Savior. And it was sad, because Jesus was there showing them everything that he was, and everything that God was, and everything that the universe was meant to be. And they were not able to accept or perceive it because all they saw was their boxes. Now there's a good lesson in this for all of us. I understand the need to be able to stay safe and control your life. In fact, the world is gonna encourage you to do this. If you try to think outside of the box of paying your bills every month, guess what? People are gonna be knocking on your door and reminding you that you gotta pay attention to that box. I get it. The whole world is geared for this box system to take advantage of it and to keep you in it. At the same time, we have to have some humility. We have to have some understanding that life is more than the box that we try to put it in. And critically, we have to understand that other people are more than the boxes that we put them in. Behind every what of that box, here's my brother, here's a store clerk, here's a whatever, is a who, a real who, a person who is infinitely loved by God, infinitely blessed with a complex and probably interesting life, who has the same set of stresses and wonders and joys and pains that all of us do in our various ways, and that that deserves to be credited as reality. And crediting that person as reality means not insisting that they fit in our box and not limiting them to it, nor only judging them by what they do for us, but instead starting with the real who of who that person is, taking time to get to know them, to care about them, to hear their story, to do whatever, to credit them as a real human being, and then using that story to inform what their life is shaped like. 
And it's not like the box that we had prepared for them any more than Jesus' life was shaped by the tomb we had prepared for him. But rather, they and God's expression through them get to reshape how we see them, the world around them, and our relationship with God. Now, this is true with all the people that God loves, those that are closest to you in your family. How many of us have said, I already know my spouse or I already know my children. Yeah, this is my kid. I know them better than everybody. I know all their strengths and weaknesses and whatever. And all of a sudden the kid grows in a certain way and tries to change or whatever. And we say, no way, no, you can't do that because that's different than the kid I know. And that makes me feel sad and out of control and whatever. And parents are estranged from their own children as their own children grow, because parents won't let their kids out of the box. This is true for romantic relationships. Again, let's look at spouses. How many people have problems in the 10th year or the 13th year of their marriage, or when they hit a certain stage in life? Maybe you get married in your 20s, and you're all young in the world, and you're going, oh my gosh, we think we know who we are, and it's this, this, and this. And then you get to 45, and you realize you are much different, and you realize your spouse is much different, but you can't let them out of the box. You can't let the definition of them and your marriage grow to encompass who they really are, and so you find that your boxes are growing farther and farther apart. How many of us in our political or social lives are tempted to lock people in certain boxes and say, those are just these people, or those are just those people, and these are my enemies, and these are my friends, not by anything they're saying or inherently bringing into the world, by, but simply by some kind of stated belief or some kind of party that they belong to, or whatever the heck it is, that we go, yep, they fit in the box, or yep, they don't, without any consideration for people as human beings. And the problem with doing this is that when we do it to one person, we will do it to everybody, up to and including God himself. And we will find in every single case what these people found with Jesus. Our definitions are not adequate, the process is harmful, and we miss everything that is good about each other and life and our relationship with God by engaging in it. Here's one last little bit of hope. We've talked about everybody else around us, how they don't fit in a box. Guess what? We don't either. How many of us define ourselves by our flaws or brokenness or whatever perceived limitations that we have about ourselves? How many of us really understand ourselves as infinitely loved and infinitely filled by God? Probably not too many, but we still are. Our lives do not belong in a box either. And we are not defined by our limitations or by our fears. Instead, we are infinitely loved, infinitely healed, infinitely embraced by God, and gifted to live outside that box in the world and with each other. We have something to give to the world that matters and is important through this gift and this affirmation from God that we are beloved and that Jesus is with us too today. Do not let yourself be seen as less than what you truly are in God's name. Celebrate your opportunity to love the world and make it better and encourage other people to do so alongside you so that our communities do not become oppressive authoritarian dictatorships where we work to see who can have the most power to stuff each other into tiny boxes and control each other but our communities become living gardens of love, joy, and peace as we tend to and care for each other in God's name. Make sure that when you look at the world, that when you look at yourself and you look at God, you are seeing the possibilities, the blessings, and the infinite joy 
that God has created you and all of us for. If you're not, ask yourself if you are trading control and fear for that joy and love that you are meant to have. And if so, understand that that's a really bad exchange to make, even if it makes you feel good in the moment. And along with the apostles in this gospel, break out of that and become the healing, loving, joyous people you were meant to be in God's name. Amen. Having heard God's word, let us pray together. Lord, we come before you as ordinary people, flawed and mistaken, doubting our own abilities, sometimes even doubting in our relationship with you. But we know that you are with us constantly, that you bless us and that you love us and that you fill us every day. And so we claim that relationship with you and we claim the goodness that comes from it, grace, and mercy and healing to share with the people around us. Let us look up from our own selves and our own doubts and serve the people around us that you call us to serve so that our footsteps, the works of our hands and the words that come from our lips might all praise you and uplift the world around us. Amen. And speaking of being uplifted, we invite you now to gather bread and wine or whatever you have on hand so we can celebrate together the sacrament of Holy Communion. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We invite you now to take the bread and the cup and to share them with the people next to you, saying the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. And if you're watching this by yourself, you may partake of the elements as I offer them to you, knowing that God is with you, filling you up just like God filled up his disciples long ago, just like God sends the Spirit to all the people across the world whom he loves today. This is your moment together with God, and we invite you to partake of this meal. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us. Even if you feel like an ordinary person this week, even if your week is going to be kind of ordinary, no worries at all. God loves you, God cares for you every day, and God will allow you to care for the people around you in ways big and small. Tend to that as you walk your journey this week, and we will see you again next week right here for another service. Until then, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Let us go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.